Okay, unit number 13. Uh, this first reflection comes from the reading, Students Become Comic Book Author Illustrators. The authors state that multimodal teaching and projects should be incorporated all year long and not just after the preparation for testing. To me, in some cases, multimodal is simply another way to showcase learning. Can it be used to prepare students for a high stakes test? I don't know about elementary level, but at high school, I think it might be possible. Students in high school have to write an argument for high stakes testing usually. Preparing a multimodal argument still helps them to identify, identify the necessary components to a well-crafted piece. My concern is that when it comes to time for the test, they are writing, not drawing, not recording, uh, audio or video or anything else. It's easy to see that multimodal presentations still require writing. So it would stand a reason that if students can craft multimodal, they can physically write as well. I've taken many multimodal theory-based classes in my time here at UB. I've created a few, even, I've even created a few multimodal presentations myself. Some of them are fun and some are challenging, like video creation and editing. It's definitely more fun, I'm just not good at it. The, this writing specifically mentions how it doesn't favor the written word. I would only worry about not preparing students to structurally write their arguments for the exam. They aren't going to get, a, get to create a multimodal project for a state exam. They still need to know how to incorporate evidence from texts and write a hook and thesis statement. I've used writing comics before during my student teaching. It worked pretty well. I know that I struggle with anything artistic like that because I'm, like I said before, just not very good at it. Just be aware that some students may really resist this mode because it's uncomfortable for them, especially if they have to draw it themselves. Using a comic creator program was a bit better when I did it, but it didn't fit my needs, mostly because I refused to pay extra for the upgraded version, which gave better images. I think that's what's great about this method is that not only does it teach students that writing can come in different formats, but that pictures can convey multiple ideas without words. A picture is worth a thousand words. This comes from teaching living poets. Honestly, if you think about it, all throughout history, people read living poets a new concept. This isn't a new concept. We read what is current and relevant today because it's cur current and relevant. You'll never understand the references in Dickens Cricket and the Hearth, for example, because we didn't live during that time. But people who read it during the time did. I disagree that it's difficult to find contemporary po poetry from living poets. It's everywhere. The problem is that hardly anyone is writing it into the curriculum. Take the Poet X. It's a novel, but it's also poetry. Many high schools read that book and even some teachers teach it. It's the same with novels as it is with poetry. Many teachers use contemporary texts in their classrooms because they know it's what will hold student interest. Current pedagogy suggests students need to see representations of themselves in literature and that the old whitewashed literature of the past only reinforces stereotypes power structures, and privilege of the white European middle class. Not many teachers I know still teach the canonical classics. Some still do, but not many. Reading success stories of people of color who have been published and are making a difference is amazing. My only worry is that we seem to teach this generation that they can just create some stuff and be famous and wealthy. Everyone wants to be a rapper, music artist, or an influencer, and they all think it's possible. I'm not one for squashing dreams or creativity, even though my eye rolling just a second ago seems to indicate that. But I think a healthy dose of reality is in order. Oliveira's got lucky, let's be honest. I know many people who write and are not lucky enough to get published except in their own blogs. This comes from uh, the reading Centering Language and Communicative Purpose in Writing from Gorton Ham Rodriguez. The most salient point in this article is to offer by multilingual students the opportunity to write in multiple languages and to provide resources to help them do so. Some texts are differently structured in different languages, so helping students to understand those differences and how to access new language texts will be helpful to them. Interestingly, the text points out how we ask students to answer questions related to a text to measure reading comprehension and being able to integrate textual evidence into writing as opposed to asking them to write about a text and their impressions or interactions with a text. That was a long sentence, sorry. 
When teaching poetry, for example, in another class I'm in, the teacher has us give our impressions of what stood out the most in the text and how we interact with it, not beating the poem over the back of a chair to force out its elements. This approach is more accessible for students, especially ENL CLD students. Most writing should be done with a real world purpose in mind. For an English teacher with integrated ENLs, it's necessary to alter assignments to make them more accessible and pertinent for students. Most teachers are afraid to allow an ENL to write in their native language because the teacher can't read other languages. Even an ENL teacher struggles with that because most of them don't speak other languages either. Not everyone speaks Spanish, and there are plenty of other languages and language speakers in schools today. The teaching and learning cycle approach would be good as long as the ENL student is able to write for a target audience that makes sense for them. Writing doesn't always or ever have to be for the teacher, similar to mentor texts, and this article incorporates them. Focusing on genre can help students to understand form and function of texts. I wish we had multilingual schools and teachers. We do our students a huge disservice, only teaching them English and forcing them to abandon their native language. The rest of this article is not at all useful in any way, shape, or form because it only focuses on Spanish and English-speaking students and their Spanish and English-speaking teachers. Walk into any school in any of the districts and you'll notice that it's not just Spanish speakers, people. Okay, my last, uh, no, it's not my, uh, my second to last. Okay, uh, this is my thoughts on the video. Hi from the instructor. Kids in middle school, middle and high school are writing essays. I know that the video talked only about the elementary kids. By seventh grade, we are expecting them to write much longer texts and incorporating things like evidence, paragraph transitions, and thesis statements. We do still get middle school students to understand that a new topic needs a new paragraph, but they should know this by seventh grade. Even my even my ENL students in seventh and eighth grade knew that a new idea needed a new paragraph. But sometimes we need to remind them of structure. I noticed that some of the tenth grade students I worked with in the city struggle last year struggled with form, especially when writing about themselves. Many of them did write in one stream of consciousness, but most of them remembered uh, that when student that you write in paragraphs. Uh, when students are writing expository texts, we ask them to annotate paragraphs for a main idea and supporting details. They practice identifying those in someone else's writing so they can transfer that skill to their own. Uh, in the paragraph construction video, paragraph is a list. I mean, they aren't exactly wrong. I have an extremely good handle on teaching paragraph construction to high school students. If I had to teach it to grades 7 and 8, I would approach it in much the same way the video suggests. I would probably workshop much of the student writing by having them workshop each other's paragraphs with a checklist. Is there a main idea? Do the paragraphs support that main idea? Do the par other paragraphs contain a topic sentence that directly relates to the main idea? If any of those answers is no, then the student fixes the sentences and paragraphs. Obviously, if I was teaching this, I would model, model, model first. Graphic organizers are great for writing down sentences and then piecing them together after. The video suggests note cards. My issue with a bunch of index cards is that high school students lose them. Uh, that might work for elementary students when they are writing that many paragraphs, a graph, uh, you know, short amount as opposed to a high school student or middle school student who's writing a lot more. Um, when they get lockers, stuff goes missing. That doesn't work. Uh, a graphic organizer is good for keeping relevant information together in one place. We try to get out of the formulaic writing method from elementary and early middle school. For seventh and eighth graders, I would expect them to never use an example of this or the text shows this when. I know they need these prompts in lower grades to help them understand what they are supposed to be writing, but by the seventh grade, they shouldn't need these anymore unless they're in remedial writing. Sentence starters are too repetitive and don't get middle school students used to the right ways or other ways. Mentor texts really would work really well here too. You can ask the students to notice how the piece doesn't use sentence starters or repeat the same opening phrases all of the time, if that's a problem that they suffer from. 
The two uh, YouTube videos that were posted for this week um, don't really, re really require any commentary, I think, on my part. They're great for elementary teachers to remember to offer kids writing time during the day. That's it. <laughs>